So good, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all here. That's uh, with a lot of energy to start the day. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll start back from where we left uh, yesterday. Um, I will redo a couple of passages because I realize I went maybe a little fast on a couple of things. Uh, that are actually quite important, if I find them back. Yes. So, all right, remember that we were talking about the Hawk Dove game uh, that, is, that can be defined uh, by a payoff matrix matrix like that where the payoff are the following okay to keep the same notation as uh, um, as yesterday and uh, I also told you that in a Population, if you were to draw, draw these two players, at random in a population where x denotes the fraction of hooks, so zero, it's only those. One is only hoax, and then you have mixed states. Then uh, uh, we saw uh, that the payoff on average of a hook is equal to, well, uh, x times g minus c over 2, uh, which is the payoff of a hook when they play against another hook. So that's, on, that's the matrix entries, uh, entry over there. Um, plus 1 minus x g, which is the payoff to a hook if they play against a dove, the other matrix entry. Uh, which in turn this equals to g minus x uh, g plus c over 2. Uh, and then the payoff of a dove on average again uh, over the sampling process in this uh, population um, would be just 1 minus x G over two, which is the payoff of a dove play, sorry, a dove plays against another dove, okay. Um, all right, so then from here, I told you, like I drew the analogy from payoffs to fitness, explaining that these could be seen as rates, if you want, therefore rate of reproduction, if you see these gains as some sort of fraction of time that you spend in a nesting site and therefore can you, you can use it to reproduce. So it's uh, uh, per unit time uh, uh, how much you can, you can, you can uh, reproduce, basically. So it's a reproduction rate, this g uh, and, and g minus c over 2. So therefore, these, these payoffs are actually fitness. This is a Malthusian growth rate. So it's absolute fitness. For those uh, that are familiar with this uh, vocabulary. Um, and then using this, uh, we can actually connect the static 
uh, the static view of like uh, what is more convenient. Again, remember that you can draw this pH and PD. P as a function of X. We did all of this yesterday. Um, I should do this. And there's a function of uh, uh, if you increase C, C, you find uh, so, so, such that C is bigger than G. So in this case, C is bigger than G. You find a point uh, uh, where this is pH, this is PD. You find a point above which being a dove is better than being a hawk, OK? Therefore, we can use the replicator dynamics that tells us that x dot, where x is still uh, the fraction of hooks, um, is equal to uh, r hook minus r dove um, times x times 1 minus x, OK? Uh, we derived this yesterday. I will not redo the algebra. Uh, yes? Uh, the x dot uh, x dot is a notation uh, for uh, derivative with respect to time. So by x dot, I actually mean the x over the t. Okay. It's a it's a common notation when writing uh, ordinary differential equations. Uh, I uh, probably maybe ne you never saw this. So whenever something writes something dot, and you assume this is a function of one variable. It means that you're deriving with respect to whichever variable this is a function of. And most of, most of the times, this is time in, when, you, when you look at physics problems. Um, so um, OK. So from here, uh, you can actually, again, uh, write down the time evolution of the, of the system uh, as a function of the parameters of the model which are here in the, in the payoff matrix. OK, so we can do it. Uh, I, th I think this is where we got uh, yesterday, right? We, we got to write uh, this, this equation. And, uh, and, from, and now I'm continuing uh, uh, with stuff we didn't do. So maybe, maybe actually now it's a good time to take some questions before I go on with, yeah. Vamos ver se está certo aqui. Uh, the RH and RD mm -hmm. are the fitness of each player. That's right. So the RH minus RD is the relative fitness of the Hawk player. The, uh, uh, the RH minus the RD, it's, uh, um, it's not really the relative fitness, because the relative fitness is, would be RH minus the average R. It depends how you define it. But it's uh, how, how much better the Hawk player does with respect to the Dove player. Yeah. Any other question? No, it's, it's just just to be sure these values, these 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 formulas, I guess, are independent of the C value, right? So this is true in general. So okay. this, this equation only follows from the definition of Malthusian growth. So it's what I told you yesterday. Uh, you, you can actually derive it from Malthusian growth uh, given those rates. 
uh, then uh, the fact that these are the payoffs, it's part of the interpretation of this framework, okay? So I'm telling you that these are actually rates. In this case, they can be thought of rates. When you build a model for a real biological system, you need to make sure that that's actually the case. So, okay. Now, I, I think you're, you're, you're getting where we are going here. I'm essentially going to plug in these two, uh, these two quantities here and try to see what the time evolution of the system is giving uh, this fitness or payoffs. So, if we do that, we get that x dot is equal, and, uh, and okay, the other thing, I'm only writing the equation for the fraction of the hoax because the fraction of the dose is always one minus that, okay? So there is no need to study two coupled equations where in fact you only have one variable in the system. And okay, if we do some algebra here, you, you are left with something that looks like uh, G over two minus um, X times G over two plus C over two minus G over two. Okay, this of course goes away. Um, and therefore you have X times one minus X times can factor this out and get one minus x c over g, okay? So the first thing we see uh, looking at this equation is that there are three fixed points, okay? One is x star equal to zero, therefore everyone here is a dove. The other one is x star equal to one, therefore everyone here is a hawk. And the third fixed point is equal to um, g over c, okay? From this, uh, from this uh, part of the polynomial. Uh, now, these are fractions. So as you could imagine from what we said uh, yesterday about this analysis, this is actually a feasible fixed point only if c is bigger than g, okay? Because it doesn't, a fraction cannot be bigger than one by definition. So we can actually study, this is a one-dimensional system. Have you done some stability analysis of uh, these? Okay, good. Uh, so this is a one-dimensional system, so the, st the analysis for the stability is fairly easy. You just plot uh, the velocity as a function of the state. Uh, and here you can see that if, if uh, C is smaller than G, okay, uh, you only have uh, uh, zero and one. And uh, the derivative is always positive. Therefore, in this case, which is the case where the hooks are always doing better than the doves, uh, in the end, uh, the, the stable fixed point is x star equal one, therefore all of the population is going to be dominated by hooks. Not surprisingly, right? Because if the hooks are the only one that can get the nest, nest insights and they can reproduce, eventually in the population you will only have hooks. Um, then, uh, in the case where the cost is bigger than the gain, you have an intermediate uh, point between zero and one, which is, again, G over C. And uh, you, can you can see here that when uh, X is very small, this is positive, and when X is bigger than uh, this ratio, this, this term is negative. Uh, therefore, 
the stable point will be a mixed state, x star equal to g over c, which is the same point. Uh, I mean, these are the same terms. So I mean, uh, uh, of course, we get the same point if one were to study the condition for which these two, these two payoffs are equal. Uh, so in this case, you actually tend to a mixed state. And you see that uh, as, as the cost become, become very big in this mixed state, you're, you're, uh, you can have more dose than actually you can have hooks sometimes. So even though individually you, you may think that hooks are stronger due to the pairwise interactions, in this case between hooks, uh, you can get uh, invasion by doves in the population. So conceptually, with the, uh, if you remember yesterday we started playing some games uh, and then I introduced this uh, and introduced this static picture. Now we are talking about the dynamics of the population uh, in this system. So the concept of what I've done uh, it was to like connect some uh, uh, action and, and behaviors in, in natural system to payoffs. From payoff, I drew a connection to fitness or growth rates. And therefore, thanks to this connection, then we can use this framework to study uh, eco-evolutionary dynamics. All right, so which is why this overall framework is called evolutionary game theory. So this is a little bit of the conceptual idea. Um, since, since these then drive the, po the population composition. Okay, yes. Uh, I'm thinking about like the practical application, for instance, what is cost and what is gain. Mm -hmm. Since it's a nest competition, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it, there would be a fight between the two individuals mm -hmm. and the cost would maybe be like physical harm in a way. It could be something like that. Yes. So I was thinking about, because right now we're thinking as if cost and gain were fixed values in a way. Mm -hmm. But if we were put time dynamics, I suppose that, that as time progresses, what is cost and what is gain could change, right? If you have some type of adaptation that maybe the, the, the dove could fight better against the hawk. OK, this reason, is uh, interesting. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, in real, so this is a very simple framework, OK? And uh, the time scales in which it's justified to use a framework like that are always, I mean, you need to always think uh, whether you're looking at the right time scale when thinking about things that are fixed uh, and in, in, a, in an evolving population. So uh, if you're looking at time scales over the individual can actually learn something, then uh, you, you may have a feedback between what happened in the past. You may have some memory effects between what happened in the past and the payoff metrics. Actually, if I manage to go uh, fast enough today, I will try to uh, give you a, show you a paper when someone did something in, in the same spirit, not exactly what you're proposing, but it's certainly possible to, to, you, to generalize this framework uh, to account for payoff matrices that depends on the history uh, of the system. Uh, it's, it, for sure, you know, this is not 
meant to be the framework that will unify all problems in biology. I mean, this is a tool to address certain types of question. If you have very complicated dynamics of the payoffs, then you're probably just better off studying a full uh, uh, differential equation systems where you have uh, some differential equation for the rates as well in case, in, in case the uh, uh, players learn at a time on a time scale that is comparable to the eco ecological dynamics. So th this, this somehow makes the assumption that uh, the ecological dynamics are I mean, they're saying ecological in this case because of course uh, Oaks and those are not evolving. Uh, this, this is a purely ecological interaction. But again, game theory can be used for evolution instead when you look at alleles or other traits. Uh, but in this ecological dynamics, we are sort of assuming that uh, the learning process or any, any process that would change the payoff is either much faster or much slower than the ecological dynamics. So there, there is always a time scale separation assumption somehow. Yes. Thanks. Uh, so I understand this is a toy model, but I was just wondering if we had a carrying capacity on our reproductive uh, term to change the qualitative behavior of you mean our a, system. You mean a logistic growth kind logistic of thing? Logistic growth, yes. OK. Um, right, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I know people did that. Uh, I, I don't have the answer right on top of my head. Uh, it, it would probably change the form of the replicator equation. Uh, I cannot tell you exactly how right now. I need to look it up. Um, so the concept would probably stay the same in the sense that you have an extra parameter, but if you consider this like, parameter fixed, uh, then you can still uh, map uh, the, the payoffs into the dynamics the form of the specific functional form of the dynamics is, is going to be different. I can, I can look up how, uh, how that actually looks like. Yes. Yeah. Why is it called replicator dynamics? <laughs> um, OK. Uh, you're, you're, you're catching me uh, out of my prep here. I, I, I admit I do not know. I mean, there's stuff that replicate, and uh, it's a dynamical thing. So I could only, uh, I could only speculate that uh, you know, it's the dynamics of, uh, uh, of uh, players that self-replicate. Uh, but I may, I may be wrong here. Any other questions? All right. So I will briefly give you some terms that people use in this uh, evolutionary game theory field. For a change, I use the white chalk. Uh, so you can have uh, certain uh, uh, types of strategies based on the, on the payoff matrix. So a first strategy you can have is an invader strategy. which is defined as a strategy that can beat any other strategy when they're dominating, meaning when you put just a few individuals with this strategy, uh, they will grow in the population. So when you have only a few individuals, they will grow. Then you can have 
unbeatable strategies. Where, which means that uh, when this strategy dominates, and no other strategy can invade it or beat it, okay? Then you can have a evolutionary stable strategy. Commonly referred as ESS which is one plus two. Therefore, if this strategy is an invader strategy and it's, un it's unbeatable once it's, it fixes, it means that it, it will eventually f fix, uh, and therefore it's an evolutionary stable strategy. And then you can have coexistence. Oops. which happens when uh, multiple strategy can, can, can invade one another. And with the Hook and Dove game, we saw an example of an, uh, an evolutionary st stable strategy, which, uh, which are the hooks in the case where the cost is uh, smaller than the gain, okay? Because the hooks will always invade and are also unbeatable. So it's an evolutionary stable strategy. And we also saw an example of coexistence if the, the cost is bigger than the gain. So in which case, those can invade a population of hawks, and hawks can invade a population of those. Okay, so we saw those two examples. Any questions at this point? One back there. Um, so the unbeatable strategy mm -hmm. you exemplified with the hawks. So you mean by dominate only that strategy survives? I'm having a hard time understanding the difference between invader and unbeatable. So invader will invade when you put a few individual in the population. Ah, you have it a does, few it doesn't mean strategy. it doesn't mean that they will uh, take over the whole population. Whereas unbeatable, it means that uh, when this species has all of the population, the other strategies cannot, uh, cannot invade it. It's two different things. Okay, yes. thank you. Other question? I have a question similar to hers, but uh -huh. my, my Difficulty is understanding the difference between evolutionary stable strategy and the unbeatable strategies. Mm -hmm. Because it feels like the unbeatable strategy also nests the invader strategy. Uh, no. Uh, you can have unbeatable strategies that are not invaders. Uh, let me actually show you an example of that. 
So consider, which is actually also very good to, to become a little more uh, handy with this uh, payoff matrix uh, framework. So let's say that you have a player A and a player B. And the payoff matrix is done as the following form. Uh, then uh, from these payoffs, we can write down the average payoffs in a, in a mixed population, which will be so P A is going to be uh, if x, x, I'm, I'm calling x is the fraction of a, okay? I always need to define this. Uh, Pa is going to be 2x uh, uh, plus uh, 5 times 1 minus x. And Pb, does anyone want to, do you want to come out and then try to do it? Yes, there is no, I mean, no, no test, uh, just, uh, just to be a little more interactive. <laughs> All right, let's think about this together. So what is, what is PB? If, uh, if you have X is the fraction of A in the population, therefore you will draw on average X A players, right? So what is the payoff, on average, the payoff of B? So let's say, what's the average gain or payoff that B will get from playing against A to start with? Uh, no. One times X. Right, yes. Because you have this times on average how many times you draw a A to play against B, okay? Now, on top of that, you need to add the, pay, the payoff that B gets when on average, when you get, when you draw a B to play against uh, a, a B. So what do you have there? Seven, one minus X, exactly. Right? Who's confused about this? In question there. No, I'm confused. You're confused. <laughs> so what is it, uh, what, uh, what is the confusion coming from? Which part of this? Morning. Hello. <laughs> I, I do not follow the, the line of thinking on this. So you're drawing, you have a population where you have some A. This is a B. And, uh, and you're drawing at random. You draw at random one focal player, okay? In which case, let's say it's A. You draw A, okay, randomly. And then you need to draw the second player to play against it, okay? at random. So you're gonna, you're gonna draw A with probability X, and you're going to draw B with probability one minus X. Is this part clear? Okay. Uh, then, on average, and I'm saying average because uh, this is a sampling process, right? Because if you just, if you throw a coin, uh, uh, five times you might get uh, five heads, okay? So this, this, is, this is only true on average, all right? Uh, on average, over many, many repeats of these experiments, you will draw uh, x, uh, you will draw a, a, a fraction of time, which is x, exactly x. And these times that you draw a against another a, you gain two, because that's your matrix entry. Say that your focal player is A, right? You drew it, it's the first player you drew. You will draw another player A, uh, an X fraction of time on average, 
and uh, each of these times you gain two. Then you draw a player B one minus x uh, fraction of times, and each of these, in each of these games you gain five. Right? You do the same with B. If, you, if, if B was your focal player, the first player that you draw, you're gonna draw again A uh, x, x fraction of times and you gain one, or, or you draw B one minus x fraction of times and you gain seven. Okay. Anyone else? Um, it, this is all making sense to me. It's just that I have to like really think about the matrix when I'm reading it. Mm -hmm. So just to make it clear, when I'm reading like the lines are the players that are going to play against A and B. <laughs> I don't know if I made myself clear. But it's like in the first line, I'm choosing A to fight against A and then in the matrix, in the matrix. Ah, okay. I'm choosing A to fight against A, then A to fight against B, yes. and then B to fight against A, and B to fight against B. Correct. So sh could I say that um, A is five times more efficient than B? Like Five I times more efficient because you're comparing this. What are you comparing to say Yes, that exactly those. These and that? Yes, because when... You, you know, mm. when A fights against B, it uh, has a five payoff, and B, when it fights against A, it has a one payoff. Mm, I mean, it depends what you mean by efficient. Like, uh, yeah. the thing is that uh, you have interactions also between themselves, also between A and A and B okay. and B. So you, ca you cannot just uh, predict what the population will do if you only consider the, f the interactions. I if, if these two entries were zero, you would okay. be right, but they are not. Okay. So you cannot predict the population behavior from just the, op the opposition interaction. Thank you. Right. So to your previous question, once we have this uh, PA and PB written down, we can actually write down the replicator equation, which is going to be, again, x is the fraction of A, is going to be x dot equal x times 1 minus x, uh, uh, and then this is going now to be PA minus PB, right? So the replicator dynamics is very powerful uh, as it allows us to draw this connection pretty easily. And then, okay, I spare you the algebra. This, sh this, this should be 3x, 3x minus 2, okay? When you just sum up uh, stuff, you can check it out. You, sh you should always check it out and never trust me when I say something like this. So this means that you have a two-third, you have an intermediate state, but given the sign of this, when x is very small, this will have a negative derivative. When x is big, bigger than the fraction, uh, it will have a positive derivative. This means that this is an unstable state. Therefore, you will either tend to one or you will tend to zero, depending on the initial conditions of your system. In this case, both of these are unbeatable strategies. If you're fixed to one, you will never be invaded by A, or sorry, uh, by B. Uh, and if you're fixed to zero, you will never be invaded by A, okay? You, they cannot invade one another but they are both unbeatable. In, and <coughs> by that definition, none of that is an evolutionary stable strategy because the fact that you observe it or not in nature, that the idea behind this is that the fact that you observe it or not in nature is merely a question of the initial conditions. So you cannot make the argument that eventually you will, say, you will see either of those two. Um, it, it isn't clear to me why they're un unbeatable. Uh, sorry? I, it, it isn't clear to me why they're unbeatable. Why they're unbeatable? Because, well, unbeatable is defined as uh, a strategy that when the strategy is dominating, they cannot be invaded. Okay. 
Okay. So it's, it's condition, this unbeatable definition is conditioned to have a fixation in the population, that uh, all of them are that strategy. Okay. It doesn't mean that they will always win no matter the, the composition. And, sorry, just... Yes. And when it is unbeatable, why is it not evolutionary stable? Well, Bec because of this, right? Because in this case, they are unbeatable. Yes. And they are not evolutionary stable uh, because whether you see them or not, it, it just depends on the initial condition. Oh, or okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's a matter of definitions, okay? I mean, you can, uh, I mean, one could argue that these definitions are counterintuitive, but, uh, you know, this is, this is what people usually refer to in the field. So, I mean, I think you should know this. Okay, so, um, ju just to make sure that I understood correctly, so when choosing, uh, uh, well, w when x is equal to zero, then choosing the uh, player B is the unbeatable strategy, and when x is equal to one, choosing A is the unbeatable strategy. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what you mean? Uh, so x equal one means that they are all A's, so and yes. you can see from that diagram that uh, that's a fixed point, yeah. that's a stable fixed point. Therefore, A is unbeatable. Okay. And okay. same thing goes for B in the other point. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, good. So, um, now, now that we know a bit of this payoff uh, uh, payoff matrix framework and how to connect it to dynamics. I wanted to introduce another type of game that is very important. You have a question? Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, it's just about coexistence. Mm -hmm. I don't think you explained it. So and coexistence is when uh, more, than one, uh, more than one strategy can invade at the same time. So sorry, this, well, more than one strategy can invade other strategies. So you remember the situation where you had uh, the hawks and the doves mm -hmm. that had uh, these. But what would be the dove strategy again? What would be the? Dove. Dove strategy? Well, it's the one we defined with the payoff matrix, right? It's it's none of these then. The uh, the dove stra okay the dove strategy in this case when c is bigger than g is an invader strategy. So is the hook strategy. Therefore, you have coexistence. Okay, so both have an invader strategy, but the hawk has an evolutionary stable strategy because it also has unbeatable strategy? The, the evolutionary stable strategy, the, where, we, where you fall here, depends on the parameters of the model, okay. okay? It depends on C. Depends on C. So if C is bigger than G, you have a coexistence. In, on the other hand, if C is smaller than G, then Hawk is an Hawk is a ESS, okay? So it depends on the parameter. And so coexistence would be coexistence of different strategies, both from the dove and from the hawk? Yes. Okay. And it's called coexistence because the, the fixed point is an intermediate state where in the population you have both. Question there? Uh, in a system that we have uh, more than two species, mm -hmm. we can have uh, one, uh, all the four types of strategies uh, happen at the same system? So with more species, it becomes a little trickier because the, the system becomes uh, a bit higher dimensional. 
and uh, you need to introduce the concept of Nash equilibria, uh, which we are not going to talk about in this lecture. It's, it gets a little bit formal. Uh, so, there is, so I uploaded, uh, um, I uploaded the, the chapter of Joshua's book uh, on the Google Drive. You can check it out. There is a short note on Nash equilibria. May, I don't know, you're going to have another uh, uh, game theory course uh, your last week. I don't know what the teacher is planning to do there. Maybe he will talk about Nash Equilibria, maybe not. Uh, I don't really know. But uh, yeah, when you have more than two strategies, uh, things become a little trickier. Essentially, essentially you need to say, uh, you need to define uh, the, the stability of a, of a strategy based on uh, in which direction perturbations would uh, make it unstable, essentially. Okay, but we can have uh, species A with species B in a coexistence strategy and species B with species D in a unbeatable strategies. So, yeah, so you will have a, a set of, uh, of fixed point that are going to be lo locally stable, uh, but, uh, you, you, but they may not be the best absolute uh, fixed point. So it always depends on, the, on in which direction you're going to perturb, uh, perturb the system. Uh, if you're interested in this, you really should look up the definition of an Nash equilibrium. Yeah. Sorry, yes. uh, I just have one more question. So we were defining um, unbeatable strategies mm -hmm. over uh, fixed points, but I wanted to know if uh, it's just being at exactly at a fixed point that defines the strategy is unbeatable or not, or being the orbit also is enough. Being the orbit, what do you mean by uh, being uh, the orbit? Being, being a point in which you get attracted to the fixed point. Being a point in which you get attracted. So, are you saying, okay, let, let me rephrase this in, just to make sure I understood the question. If, in this case, if this, if this point would tend to zero, is this your question? Yes. If it, yes. But it's not exactly zero, is that? Is that the question? Yeah. Well, that's technically still coexistence because you will still have an epsilon of those in the system. If I got your question right, which I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So we can we can talk about it uh, later. Um, okay. So we can now see another paradigmatic uh, game which is the prisoner dilemma. Who heard of this before? Good. So, say that you have Say that uh, you and a partner committed some sorts of crime, uh, and but uh, unfortunately uh, you get you get caught by the police, and uh, you will have you have uh, you, you get interrogated separately. Okay, so you don't uh, you don't uh, talk to your partner before you uh, you have to talk to the cops, uh, and essentially you can have two strategies that you need to choose from. Either you cooperate with your partner, not with the police, which means that you stay silent, or you defect, meaning uh, you talk to the police, You talk to the police uh, trying to make a deal, uh, basically screwing up your partner. So I in this case, one could think about a payoff matrix 
that is done. So this is actually, okay, I'm not doing the payoff matrix. I'm doing a matrix where I'm gonna, the inputs of this matrix are going to be the years, the punishment. So if you want it, see the inverse of the payoff matrix. So these are gonna be the years that you spend in jail uh, if that, uh, if that pairing happens. So if you're part, so for instance, if you decide to uh, cooperate and stay silent, and so does your partner, you both get one year of jail, okay? And uh, <coughs> so the objective of each of the two of you will be try to minimize the years in jail, right? So, um, okay, I, I usually, uh, I usually make this, play this game, but uh, I'm a little afraid that uh, we are running a little short on time for that, yes. So we, we probably, we will unfortunately have to, to skip it. Uh, but if you want to ruin some friendships, uh, this is a great one you could try and do uh, at some point uh, in, the, in, in the future. Uh, it's fun. Uh, where you essentially split up in pairs like we did yesterday and you need to uh, decide whether you're gonna cheat on your partner or you're, you're going to cooperate. And uh, more often than not, uh, people uh, defect on one another. So, but you get the idea, right? So you're, you're gonna have a situation in which uh, you, you're facing this, the, the choice whether to cooperate and maybe get one year of jail uh, or 20 years of jail if the other guy cheats on you, uh, or to defect and go out, walk out for free or get 10 years of jail if, uh, if uh, the other person uh, defects. So now we can turn this matrix into a payoff matrix to connect to the concept that we were looking at earlier. So I'm going to essentially now take some payoffs uh, out of the year of jails uh, that, you, that you get. So we can imagine a situation where the payoff matrix is going to be, I'm giving names to these numbers, okay? So These are the parameters of our prisoner dilemma, where for instance, you may have three, five, this is the example we will study, zero, one. Say that I made up some metric to, tra to transform the zero of J in some sorts of payoff, okay? Uh, and uh, the prisoner dilemma is defined when uh, uh, T, by the way, the, 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 these actually have some meaning, these letters. So R is called reward in the game theory field. Uh, T is the temptation to cheat. Right, because it's what you may want to get out of cheating your, par uh, your partner. So in this case, walking out of for free, essentially. Then you have uh, uh, P is the punishment for both cheating on one another. And then uh, S is the sucker's payoff. So, it's, it's, uh, it's the payoff uh, your loyal friend gets for, for being loyal to you while you cheated on, uh, on them. So you walk, you walk out for free and he gets in for 20 years. So, th so that's, pretty, that's pretty sad. So, a prisoner dilemma is defined by a quantitative condition which reads that T 
needs to be bigger than, uh, than R, that needs to be bigger than P, that needs to be bigger than S, okay? This is the definition given the payoff matrix of a prisoner dilemma. This is the only, you, you talk about prisoner's dilemma only if this is, if this is uh, uh, true. So you have this like kind of structure where the arrows I'm drawing means greater than, okay? And uh, in this situation, if you look, okay, I always find more intuitive thinking about years of jail than, than payoff in this case. So if we go back at the years of jail matrix for a little moment, you may realize, I, I will actually ask you the question, what do you think is the more, more logical thing to do? Provided you can't agree on something with your, with your partner beforehand. Uh, no, it's happening once, right? I mean, you, you're facing the police, and uh, like they're asking you, and uh, they're not going to ask you, ah, oh, let's do this three times, and <laughs> let's see what, <laughs> what happens. No, you don't discuss, because they, 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 they take you, and they bring you in different cells, and then they interrogate you. So you, you, don't, you don't discuss. It's always better to defect, because the most logical thing to do, provided you cannot reach an agreement, is always to defect. Because uh, if, if, you're, if you, you don't know what the other is going to do. If the other is going to cooperate, if you defect, you get zero, right? So let's say versus C, if I defect, I get zero. If I cooperate, I get one. Therefore, defect wins. I walk out for free versus another defector, if I, if I cooperate, I'm, I'm in for 20 years, which is not a lot of fun, and if I defect, because I made a deal with the police, I walk out after, after 10. So again, given that you don't know what the other is doing, uh, the, the most logical thing is to, um, is to defect indeed on the individual uh, scale. Now, of course, this leads to the outcome that a lot of times, when you play this game, both defect. Because they make the same reasoning, right? And therefore, if both defect, you both get 10 years. Whereas, had you both cooperated, you only get one year, right? But this is the whole point why the police doesn't let you speak beforehand before interrogating you, right? So, so that you cannot, you cannot have a strategic thinking that manages to bring you to a state that is globally more convenient for you even though individual reasoning would drive you to the other solution, okay? You can also try to do some very complicated thinking, saying, okay, I know, uh, I know I'm a smart guy, so I can predict that, uh, uh, that this will happen, so I will actually cooperate because I know that the other, my friend is a smart guy as well, so in the end we both cooperate. But this happens in an extreme minority of cases, so the, most of the time both, both persons defeat the fact on one another. So, Yes, please. Um, so I, I was just wondering, this uh, matrix that we drew uh, was just the time we spent in jail, right? Yes. Can, can, I know it has an inverse, but can we think of the payoff matrix as the actual inverse of this one? Well, uh, Hmm, interesting, maybe, uh, let me think. You could, you could uh, saying uh, 
Uh, every, second, uh, every second I'm not in jail, I will spend reproducing myself, and therefore, <laughs> and therefore that, would, uh, that would work. Uh, at, the same t at the same time, well, your partner is going to take nine months to produce an offspring, so I mean, uh, it gets a little more complicated than that in real terms. But uh, yeah, I mean, you could, you could if you wanted to. I was just wondering about a payoff matrix, not about reproduction. But <laughs> but, right, but then what is the payoff? Yeah, fair enough. So these are rates, okay? So when, when thinking about the, the replicator dynamics, these are rates. So you need, you actually, it's actually important when you do modeling to try and actually think what, what a rate would be, right? Because these are as, me, as units of one over time, okay? In, also, if you don't do it, you will notice very fast that zero means infinite. What is an infinite payoff? What does it mean? I mean, I mean, the inverse doesn't, has, doesn't have an infinite entry. It has a negative one, but not an infinite one. Well, if you, uh, right, if you, if you, if you, if you do one over, uh, one over zero, there's going to be an infinite payoff for the DED. Oh, but I mean, not just like uh, actually flipping the, the fractions, actually writing it as a matrix and just and you inverting. want to invert the matrix? Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Um... I, I can say the matrix out loud and you can think if it makes sense. What would that be? It's one. Yes. Minus two to the right, to the right. Uh, zero. Uh -huh. And one over 10. And one over 10. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it could, I mean, it does make sense. Um, but then again, what, I mean, the, the condition is, is satisfied, okay? So this is, this is a, a prisoner dilemma. Uh, this is, oh no, it's not actually. Sorry, what am I saying? So this is, this is the zero, not this. Yes, yeah, that's No, okay, so actually it's, it does, it's not a prisoner dilemma. Interesting. Um, because T is not bigger than R. Yeah. I've, I've never thought about this problem, so I don't, uh, I don't really know in practice what it means. You can actually try, try to get a better intuition by getting back to the replicator dynamics and, and try to do it explicitly with inverse with one over determinant uh, and the term for t that you use to invert the matrix there to try and split it up and see what actually that means. I've never tried to do it, so I don't know. But couldn't you, couldn't you just take the, couldn't you just, couldn't you just take minus this matrix because then it satisfies all, then you, then you consider the yield spending jail as the cost. I, I so, <coughs> you can, you can take uh, minus this matrix uh, if you want. Uh, I mean, y if you take minus this matrix, this definitely is a, um, a prisoner dilemma. Uh, but then again, what is the model? I mean, what, is, what are these rates, right? I mean, is when, you, when you think, I mean, we are not just playing with numbers, okay? I mean, here in a way we are, but uh, uh, when you try to make a model for something, you actually have some stuff that uh, are rates, okay? So, and I don't know, negative rates, maybe they are death rates, but uh, you, know, you, need to, you need to be a little bit careful when thinking about, uh, when you're actually trying to model uh, some biological system, uh, you need to ask yourself whether it makes sense to put just because you're doing a simple mathematical operation, it doesn't mean that you're doing something that makes, sen that makes sense uh, for the system you're studying. So, sorry, uh, well, was, it, was someone gonna, no? Um, so the reason why we were uh, discussing uh, nests mm -hmm. in the first problem is because nests were related to reproduction and devo yes. the, uh, development of, yes. okay, the population. Yes. 
That, that's right. Now here, the, the, I agree that here the analogy is a little bit more in the air. In fact, it's not there. Uh, but I wanted to present you with the, with the prisoner dilemma structure because now then we are going to actually see a biological experiments with, where they linked it to some real biological system. So, and really, all I wanted to do with the, uh, the prisoner dilemma, I'm just going to tell you what happens uh, to the replicator dynamics when you have matrices with this, with this structure, essentially. So, If you, if you draw again the payoffs, okay, now X is the fraction of cooperators, okay? So don't get confused because before it was the hoax, which in a way had a factor, so. So the thing that happens here is that uh, as we basically already discussed, the payoff of the, factor, uh, of the factors is always bigger than the payoff of cooperators. So individually, it's always better to the fact than it is to cooperate. On the other, on the other hand, uh, the state where everyone is a cooperator has overall a bigger payoff than the state where everyone is a defector, okay? So when uh, e x is equal to one, uh, the payoff of, co of uh, cooperators uh, is equal to three in that we're using that matrix, okay? I'm using this matrix here. Uh, and uh, when x is equal zero, therefore ev everyone is defecting, the payoff of a defector is equal to one, okay? So even though individually it's always better to defect, you end up in a state, uh, well you end up, I'll show you in a, in a moment, but uh, uh, when everyone follows these logics and everyone uh, defects, the whole system is doing worse than if everyone was agreeing and cooperating. And this is why the prisoner dilemma is called a dilemma, right? The, the overall optimum is not what you would uh, get by reasoning only on the other person's strategy. You need to have a strategic thinking and cooperate. Now, if we write down the replicator dynamics, you end up with 3x minus 4x minus 1 here. I just did what we were just doing before. So you have minus x times 1 minus x times uh, x plus 1. Therefore, uh, this is always negative. And you inevitably tend to a fixed point where x star is equal to zero, so all the factors. Therefore, the dynamics of this system uh, bring you to, to a state that is worse than if you manage to like, cooperate. And this is called tragedy of the commons. All right. So, um, which is actually the same, uh, uh, it is, it, this was already happening with the Hawk and Dove game when, uh, when the gain is bigger than the cost, but uh, we weren't focusing on that yet. Now, I told you this because there, is a, there are many, many cool works that try to match 
uh, payoff matrices with uh, uh, biological system, but in particular, I wanted to tell you about a paper that I actually loaded on, uh, on the Google Drive, so if you want to read it afterwards, um, it's, it's a really nice, it's a really nice and simple paper, it's very short, which is a prisoner dilemma in a RNA virus. So it's this paper from uh, Turner and, and Chow that was published in Nature in 1999. Yes. Can you tell me what's linked to the first equation there? This one? This is the replicator dynamics. This is 3x minus 4x minus 1. So I'm just solving uh, given the, the matrix uh, that, I, that I raised that was there. I partly erased. This was the matrix. Yeah, the thing is we weren't able to read the four. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yes. It's a bit a bit squeezed in there. Um, okay. Can you just briefly what's the tragedy of the commons? The tragedy of the commons is the fact that uh, if you look at these dynamics, the, the, the uh, population will tend to a situation where all are defectors. And therefore, yes, and therefore you get a lower payoff overall than if uh, you, you were co cooperating. So you're, you're doing worse off, essentially, because of like, this mechanism where individual is always better to defect. OK, so in this paper, uh, essentially, they, they, they studied uh, two different phages. So I, I introduced what a phage is briefly, but maybe I should do it again. Um, who doesn't know what a phage is? Everyone knows? What? What a phage is. Phage? Yes. You don't know, OK. So, so I should explain it. So phages are essentially viruses that infect bacteria, bacteriophages. So if you have a bacterium, this phage will put its uh, genetic material inside the bacterium. And then uh, uh, this will enter the, the chromosome and it will use uh, the metabolism of the bacteria and its, its transcription mechanism uh, to produce many other copies of itself, like viruses do. And then it will kill the bacterium and this, this other virus will go out of the bacterium. So it essentially makes the bacterium explode and all of the other viruses go around and infect other bacteria. They're pretty mean, they're pretty nasty for the bacteria. So, which means that it can be very good for us. So, um, okay, so you have, oops, no, wrong button. And it's not. So I'm, I'm gonna point at that, at that screen. Uh, sorry for those that are on that side. Um, in, in, that, in that paper, you have, you have two different strains of phages, the wild type and the mu mutant that, uh, that was evolved in a situation where there are a lot of phages around. So basically, this mutant and also these phages, if you have two types of phages, sometimes they, they can inf inf infect together the bacterium, OK? So in this case, you have many, many phages that are in fact in the same bacterium. And this mutant was evolved in a situation where you have a lot of these viruses. So most of the time, in the same infected bacterium, you're going to have many different, uh, many different uh, phage uh, genetic material. 
Now, what they, what they know is that these, these phages, they need uh, some protein uh, to, to produce uh, the copy of themselves. And one of the two phages produces this protein, and the other phage steals it from, from uh, the other phages that are in the same bacterium. So in a way, in this system, there is uh, a cooperator that produces the protein and a defector that steals the protein that is produced by the other. And uh, of course, producing a protein costs uh, energy. So uh, the, the it, really, this, this is a cooperation defector uh, game where the cooperator produces something for the other and the defector steals it uh, for, for itself. And uh, they hypothesized that uh, the uh, cooperator might be the wild type and the mutant might be the defector because it evolved in a situation with many other phages at the same time. Therefore, some of those phages will produce this protein for them. Okay? So they always are in a situation where they can steal stuff from others, okay? And uh, to prove this hypothesis, and they also hypothesize that this, this is an instance of a prisoner dilemma. Therefore, they have to come up with some things to measure in this system with these phages and bacteria to prove that indeed the wild type is the cooperator uh, and the mutant is the factor and that the quantitative condition for a prisoner dilemma is satisfied, okay? So T bigger than R, bigger than P, bigger than S, rather than uh, uh, anything else, let's say. But because otherwise it's not a prisoner dilemma. So what they did is that they competed uh, the, the wild type uh, against the wild type and the mutant against the mutant, and then the wild type ag against the mutant to see all the different pairs of these two players game like we were doing uh, before with the hawks and doves. So, essentially, uh, they, what they did is that, apart from, uh, apart from technical details, uh, where they actually evolved these this, this, uh, phages so that they could see, okay, when, when you put phages on a petri dish that is full of bacteria, these phages will kill uh, some, some of these bacteria and they will form plaques. And they made it so one of the types was creating clear round plaques and the other types was doing something more, like uh, a bit more shaded. And so they could actually differentiate which plaques were produced by the wild type and which plaques were, were produced by the, by the um, uh, mutants. And uh, they mixed uh, the wild type and the mutant at different, uh, a different combination. So if you want different X, okay? So they pick different axes of uh, com composition between mutant and wild type and then they infect bacteria with it. So, and then they measured the relative difference between, okay, I should write it down because it's not super clear from this slide. Ah, whatever. Um, they measure relative fitness Uh, between R1 and R0, where R1 is the number, if you want, not exactly, but almost, number of mutant plaques at time one, at a certain given time after the experiment starts, over the number of wild type at T1. 
and R naught is the same at T zero, okay? So essentially this W tells you how much the mutant mag magnifies itself uh, with respect to a wall type compared to the initial uh, condition, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a measure of how well the mutant is doing with respect to the wild type. Is this more or less clear so far? Okay, and I know you never uh, really saw phages and bacteria, many of you, but maybe, but uh, I hope this is uh, intuitive enough. And, uh, and this essentially they count the holes in the bacterial colony. To, see, to say how many phages they have. Then, uh, varying the initial fr frequency of uh, mutant in the population, therefore, they, if you want, they are, they are varying x, okay, in this, in this plot, um, <coughs> where when x is equal to one, since they are hypothesizing that the mutant is the defector, it's all, uh, it's all defectors, okay? And then they measure the mean fitness relative to the ancestors, meaning uh, they essentially measure, measure this, uh, this W. This is a control where they are uh, competing uh, wild type versus wild type, uh, and they made it where they actually um, uh, made, made it possible to uh, distinguish two wild types. So they, the, the two phages are essentially this exactly the same thing, but you can differentiate what plaques are originated by one and what are originated by the other. So given that this is a mean, uh, mean fitness, by definition, if you're competing the wild type against the wild type, it should give you one, which, it, which indeed is what, uh, is what they have, meaning the, at time one, the ratio stays the same as it was at time zero, as it should be since these two, these two things are identical genetically. Uh, and then uh, they measured, uh, first of all, okay, and this one basically tells you what they are trying to do with these experiments is that they are looking at the payoff as a function of x and they are trying to fill in the matrix entries, okay? Therefore, one is the cooperator against a cooperator. If indeed the, 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 the hypothesis that the wild type is a cooperator is, is correct, okay? So they, they have one, okay? One there. Now, can anyone tell me from this graph uh, what they think the entry for the factor against a cooperator should be? Or, well, here as well. What do you think? Anyone, does anyone have a like, uh, hypothesis? Which, which the factor uh, against a cooperator. It's the T, right? It's the T, yes. Um, no. Wh where are you getting the 1.5 from? Here? No, the one in the middle. This one. Yeah. Mm, not really, because here the frequency is about 0 0.5, so you don't really know who's playing against whom. Because the play, the game, is having uh, two phages infected the same bacterium at the same time. Yeah, it's two. It's two. Very good. Yes. Because when you have very few, when you have very few mutants, you know that whenever a mutant is infecting uh, some bacterium, it's probably going to infect it together with the, with the cooperator. Because you have very, very few mutants and you have a lot of cooperators, but you're still measuring how much mutants the mutants are producing. You see? So this is the reasoning behind this. So this is two, indeed. Now, to get P, 
it's, it was tricky. I mean, they actually had to do a different experiment because you, cannot, you, cannot, you can never measure P from this experiment. You need a situation, and also the fitness here is relative, okay? So to measure P, you need to do something where you're sure that you have monoclonal, like monoclonal infected cells, so bacteria that are infected either only by defector or only by cooperator. So what they did is that they took a bunch of bacteria, put them with a lot of wild type, then they took a bunch of other bacteria and put them with a lot of uh, mutants, and therefore all of the bacteria that were left were certainly infected by either all mutants or wild types, and then they mixed these infected bacteria together and they scored how they did relative to one another. And what they found, it's a, bi it's a bit involved, but if you think about it, it makes sense. Uh, and uh, I invite you to actually read the paper. It's, five, it's a five-page page paper, it's really fast uh, to read. So what they found is that when they do that, uh, the, the, fa the mutants actually do worse than the wild type. Which makes sense because they don't have the protein that they were stealing from, right? So, so essentially they took, they had a very smart way of dividing infected cells, being sure that they were infected only by the same uh, uh, phage, uh, phage type. They put them together and in the end they found uh, that the yellow, the yellow phage, so the mutant, uh, was producing less offspring than the, than the white one. Yes, question there. I quite didn't get it. Uh, you said that the mutant did worse than the white type, but uh, when we did the parallel with the prisoner's dilemma, you said that the mutant would assume the defector's place? Yes, so the mutant does worse only when they play against other mutants. So if there is only mutant in their world, the community will do worse. Which is the same as saying that when x is equal to zero here, uh, the, the payoff is lower than when x is equal to one. So there is, okay, the confusion maybe comes from the fact that uh, one of the confusions may be the fact that here x is the frequency of cooperators, there x is actually the, the frequency of defectors, okay? Because they, they use this, this other scheme. But uh, um, the payoff, even in the prisoner dilemma, the payoff when everyone is a defector, so in this case when everyone is a mutant, it's uh, lower than if everyone, or even lower than if uh, you have uh, defectors in a cooperator population, which is the two here, okay? And, uh, and then to get S, basically, to get S, you essentially realize that uh, the, that's, the, that's the payoff of a cooperator into a defector. So the payoff of uh, a cooperator into a defector uh, would be um, you have a ratio there, here, between these two points, okay? So when everyone is a defector, you know uh, how much worse the cooperator is doing rather than the, the defector, okay? So the payoff of a cooperator into a defector will be 1 over 1.3, which is the, the ratio that they measure in the experiments, okay? It's, those two, it's that uh, ratio there indicated by the arrows. The payoff of a defector uh, into a defector, which gives 0 0.65. Okay. 
Because even though, even though the factors are doing bad against the factor, they are still doing better than cooperators against the factors. Okay, this is what this plot is showing you. So they essentially manage, and, and if you look at this matrix, it does uh, satisfy the, the structure of a prisoner dilemma, which means that, uh, funnily enough, evolution uh, brought uh, uh, the appearance and actually the fixation in some colony of these mutants into a tragedy of the common where actually these mutants, when, they're, when they are left alone, are doing worse than the wild type. So this is a very, I mean, this is, this is a very nice example of uh, situations in which you can get uh, something bad by, by evolutionary processes. Yes? Thinking more like of a long-term effect of this, could this be interpreted as, I don't know, if it, could, if it could be interpreted as parasitism or at least like a, uh, a evolutionary path that could lead to parasitism. Yeah, you could think of it as a sort of parasitism. I mean, okay, I'm not a biologist, so I mean, I, I'm sure they have some more specific definition for what a para para parasite is, but it's a sort of uh, uh, parasitic interaction, yes, from an ecological point of view. question there. Uh, I'm not sure how true this question is, but <laughs> uh, I was curious because you said that the mutant uh, variant actually stole the, the protein in order to have an offspring. Mm -hmm. And in, at least when I thought about it, I thought that if you would put uh, a cell uh, bacteria that would have only mutants, the payoff would actually be zero because they would have no protein to steal from. So I was kind of asking So it's not like they steal all of the proteins. They are still, be, they are still able to produce some. Oh, OK. Yes. That makes sense. Thank you. So, um, okay, so I think we are at time. I, I just want to mention uh, that, uh, okay, we didn't have time for this, but I, we, I, I think we did cover the most important stuff I wanted uh, to do. Um, there is actually a pretty cool paradigm that can save you from the tragedy of the common if you, for instance, account for the fact that you can either have repeated games or for the fact that uh, if you keep cheating and defecting, you may make the environment worse, okay? So if you can, if you want, uh, the slides are on the, um, on the Google Drive, and whenever you have time, you can check out the, the end up of this, uh, of this presentation, where, which essentially, apart from what I did today, uh, it presents the results from this PNAS paper by Joshua uh, and other people, where they couple uh, environmental dynamics, they, they introduce an extra variable for our environment and the payoff matrix depends on the environment and based on the payoff matrix you have cooperator and defector and the more defector you have, the worse the environment gets, okay? And the more cooperation you have, the better the environment gets. So, which actually traces back to your question before because this introduces a memory of the system, because if you're, if you're uh, making the environment worse because everyone is defecting all the time, uh, and there are many examples of this, like vaccinations, public good in, uh, in um, microbes, uh, uh, control measures for water or resources. So it's a bit technical, but you can try to check it out what they, what they did, and essentially, in a nutshell, what they found is that uh, uh, for certain parameter values in, this, in their model, um, you find that uh, you can either have the normal tragedy of the common, which is the one that I just told you, where the 
environment eventually gets completely depleted because everyone keeps, keeps defecting and you get to a population with only defectors. Or you can get some oscillations that you actually see when, uh, when, uh, pol with policy control uh, in, in a lot of cases, lockdowns, uh, water resources management. I mean, something you see a lot of times. Oscillations are still bad, though, because they, the environment can get very low uh, in resources with big oscillations. And there, there is a regime of the parameters, when, where, which is when people cooperate a lot when the environment is really bad, where actually you can get to a stable state uh, in the environment where the environment is maybe not completely good, like uh, you don't have all of the resources, but you have enough resources. So we didn't have time for this, but you have both the slides and um, the paper, which is this one. This one. Uh, PNAS 2016 in the Google Drive. So if you want to check it out, I think it's a cool generalization of what I told you, of what I told you these two days. All right, and that's it. And uh, tomorrow we have uh, a computational lab on these, uh, on these topics. All right.